Hello, I'm Dr. William Schlosser, Washington State University School of the Environment. This is my classroom. Nope, it's not special effects. This video really does capture a section of forest in Quebec heaving to and fro, looking like it's a living, breathing, sentient woodland. But no, there's no mysterious magic at work here, even if it is suspiciously close to a Lords of the Rings trilogy scene. No giants are sleeping under those rocks, no spooky forest spirits are at play. Instead, explains Mark Siros of Southern Quebec Severe Weather Network, it's an understandable meteorological phenomenon in which the elements have come together just right to create this unusual scene. When you look at the trees in the background, it's clear that the winds are very strong, Cyrus notes. The forest floor seems to be moss-covered, which leaves a lot of root system of younger trees lodged in a loose medium. As the winds sway the trees, you get the roots lifting the floor. This gives the appearance of breathing. We can blame this one on the wind, shallow soils, and adaptive genetic traits of trees existing in this restrictive environment of Quebec. Ecological habitat destruction is the process of changing the area in which a plant, animal, or other organism lives to the point where the species can no longer survive. Habitat destruction comes in three forms, actual destruction, fragmentation, and degradation. Actual destruction is the destruction of habitat and some species instantly. The damage is instant and extremely hard for the species to recover from. Fragmentation occurs when the land gets split into pieces. Degradation happens when something is introduced to the ecosystem or habitat that causes harm. We can consider these levels of change in terms of succession. Succession is a gradual and orderly process of change in an ecosystem brought about by the progressive replacement of one plant community by another until a stable climax is established. From the Latin, succedere means to follow from one to another. The orderly process of community development is directional and predictable. It results from the modification of physical environments stemming from modifications by the community. Succession is community controlled even though the physical environment determines the pattern rate of change in limits. Each environment resolves with patterns, a uh, rate of change, and limits. This all culminates in a stabilized ecosystem in which biomass and symbiotic function between organisms are maintained with unity and energy flow. We evaluate claims, evidence, and reasoning that the complex interactions in ecosystems maintain relatively consistent numbers and types of organisms in stable conditions, but changing conditions may result in a new ecosystem. Forest succession occurs as one community of plant species replaces another. Much like ecological succession, forest succession is gradual, but typically focuses on tree species. Occurring in several stages, forest succession is a cyclical process which allows forests to take root. As the name implies, each stage is successive, but the process can be set back to any given stage due to outside disturbances. Disturbances could include fire, parasitic insects, volcanic activity, or anything else that would interrupt the natural succession of the species. These changes are fairly predictable and orderly. Within an ecological community, the species composition will change over time as some species become more prominent while others may fade out of existence. As the community develops over time, vegetation grows taller and the community becomes more established. Wildlife respond to the environmental conditions created with some benefiting and others fading away. It is a normal series of events and the status quo is rarely sustainable. Change is a persistent factor in ecological balance. Before discussing the stages of forest succession, it is necessary to understand the importance of shade tolerance and shade intolerance. Different species of trees require different amounts of sunlight. Trees which require shade for saplings to grow are shade tolerant while those trees which thrive in full sun are labeled as shade intolerant. 
Trees can fall anywhere on the spectrum from very shade tolerant to very shade intolerant, creating more than just two categories. The first stage of forest succession is the grass stage, which occurs after land has been cleared due to a natural or unnatural event. The sudden clearing floods the ground with sunlight. Very shade intolerant pioneer species like lodgepole pine, aspen, or cottonwood begin to compete with the grasses. At this stage in their life, these trees are mere seedlings, but pioneer species are typically fast growers. In the second stage, the shrub stage, the most shade intolerant pioneer saplings will share the area with small shade intolerant shrubs. As the stage progresses, Pioneer saplings start to dominate the area, growing tall and shading the surrounding shrubs. The shade intolerant shrubs can no longer grow under the shade of the pioneer trees and they die as a result. As the pioneer saplings grow, they begin spreading seeds on the forest floor. As the crowns of the pioneer species fill the canopy gaps in the forest, direct sunlight can no longer reach the forest floor. This is the young forest stage. 25 to 40 years after the grass and the shrub stage. The seedlings dropped from the shade intolerant pioneer species are now unable to grow because the new shade created by their parents. With the second generation of pioneer shrubs stunted in shade, more shade tolerant species like spruce, grand fir, western hemlock, and western red cedar are able to get established. Disturbances, whether they are naturally occurring or human-induced, are measured in terms of impact and duration. The impact is the severity of the earthquake, the intensity of the wildfire event, or the area impacted by landslides. These are taken together with the duration of the disaster episode. These are measured in terms of how long the wildfire persisted on each site, the number of days or months the windstorms persisted, or how many hectares or acres were impacted by the bark beetle attack. When taken together, the stress on the ecosystems are put into context of the serial disruptions. The process that brings forests back to land scorched by fire, buried in landslides, or even cleared by logging is called forest succession. Serial stages are how we describe the process of change. A serial community is an intermediate stage found in an ecological succession in an ecosystem advancing towards its climax plant community. In many cases, more than one serial stage evolves until climax conditions are attained. There are many different types of natural habitats. Different species have adapted to different habitats. The animal species relies on its specific natural habitat for resources that include a place to mate, a place to raise their young, and food to eat. Plant species thrive in temperature, precipitation, and timing. All are brought into focus as they progress through physical environments and several stages of development. Succession routes from the status of the abiotic foundations of life. This may start from lava spilling across the earth. How does life arrive here? This is where primary succession begins. Primary succession occurs when a community or group of species evolves from a barren land with no life at all. The surface is completely fresh and devoid of life. Primary succession occurs after volcanic eruptions. Hot lava spews from the earth, coating the land around it. The area near the volcano starts with no life at all. Eventually, seeds will land and pioneer species will begin to colonize the area. The pioneer species will begin to break down the volcanic rock and establish soil and other plants that can grow. The islands of Hawaii stand thick with tropical rainforests. How does volcanic rock, lifeless and barren, come to harbor the diversity of a tropical rainforest? Oftentimes, this initial spread of life comes from lichens and mosses. Each lichen is made up of a fungus, usually an acemicete, and an algae green or blue-green. Lichens come in many colors, sizes, and forms, and are sometimes plant-like, but lichens are not plants. A lichen consists of a simple photosynthesizing organism, usually a green algae or cyanobacterium, surrounded by filaments of a fungus. Lichens can be seen as being relatively self-contained miniature ecosystems, where the fungi 
algae, or cyanobacteria have the potential to engage with other microorganisms in a functioning system that may evolve as an even more complex composite organism. They are among the first living things to grow on fresh rock. They initiate the creation of soils where advanced plants can grow. These simple organisms begin breaking down the resources in the environment and make it suitable for the later introduction of more complex species, such as vascular plants. As these organisms carry out their life processes, they produce waste and some die. This leads to the formation of the organic material that will become soil. This is the fundamental first step into primary succession. Now, we move ahead in serial succession steps. Early invader plants are growing on the site, and secondary succession takes place. Imagine a forest where a wildfire rages through the forest and all animals race ahead trying to escape its roaring progress. It seems as if the fire is killing everything in its path. So what happens when a fire like that burns itself out? Does the land that was forest or grassland stay barren, charred, and empty? Well, of course not. Small plants, primarily what we would call weeds, start to grow in the first few months after the initial devastation. And in a few years, trees and shrubs may have sprouted, making the scene of the disturbance much more inviting. This process of regrowth that an ecosystem undergoes after a destructive event such as a fire, avalanche, agricultural clearing, deforestation, or disease, just to name a few, is known as secondary succession. There are several expected stages in secondary succession which are actually very similar to those of primary succession. But one thing is important to keep in mind. For secondary succession to occur, there must already be, well, yeah, you guessed it, soil. A forest is a type of habitat that has a dense population of trees. There are forests all over the world, and many diverse species live inside this type of habitat. In order for a forest to survive, it needs to have a water source that will support the large amount of trees. Temperate coastal rainforests are just one type of forest. While they occur on less than 5% of the earth, an abundance of water, year-round warm temperatures, and plenty of resources for animal and plant species to survive. This ecoregion is a subregion of the Cascadia bioregion. These rainforests occur in a number of ecoregions, which vary in their species composition, but are predominantly of conifers sometimes with an understory of broadleaf trees, ferns, and shrubs. As we watch this forest growth series, prepared into five-year increments, it is important to recognize that we watch trees grow older. We are not watching forest succession. This is one plant community growing older. This population will be replaced based on the conditions of the environment as the new population members sprout. Just being older does not mean climax plant community status. We look for the ability of species to reproduce in the community where they live. That makes a self-replicating plant community. This process of regrowth is called secondary succession and is different from primary succession because there has already been a community of life in the area of the disturbance, and there is typically still some life present. This is unlike primary succession, where you begin with bare rock, no life, even though the ecosystem in question may have been drastically altered. There is soil, which may be housing seeds, nutrients, and other vital components that will make the recolonizing by the growth of the producers, typically plants, occur much more quickly. Secondary succession is a natural process that occurs as ecosystems try to maintain their own form of homeostasis, their balance. It can occur in any terrestrial ecosystem, but the most dramatic examples tend to be in forested areas where the tree lines and stumps illustrate the stark contrast between what is and what used to be. A good example is the forest fire in Yellowstone National Park in 1988 that swept through over 700,000 acres, but is now moving successfully through the succession process. Secondary succession follows a predictable pattern of regrowth, beginning with weeds and grasses and culminating in a climax community. 
A climax community is a stable plant community where the types of vegetation will no longer change unless another disruption occurs, and it is unique to the habitat where the succession is occurring. In other words, there is not a set stopping point for succession. It will continue to progress towards a more mature community until no more maturation is possible, when it reaches climax, or when another disturbance occurs to cause it to begin the process all over again. The stages of succession resolve around the types of vegetation that spring up. The basic order begins with weeds and grasses, which could be annuals that die off yearly or perennials that grow back year after year, followed by shrubs and then small, quickly growing trees, and finally trees that are slower to mature, such as western red cedar or Engelmann spruce. Of course, this is variable by biome. A biome is a term used to describe a particular ecosystem characterized by the specific plants and climate. Grasslands, deserts, tundra, and tropical rainforests are all examples of different biomes. A grassland biome is not going to develop into an oak forest climax community any more than a desert is going to develop into a grassland. The amount of time necessary to reach the climax community varies by climate as well. In the tropics, a climax community may be reached in as little as 10 to 15 years, whereas in the deciduous forest of North America, it may take 100 years or more. So, to put in a nutshell, secondary succession is the predictable pattern of regrowth an ecosystem follows in the wake of a disruption, be it natural or human-caused. It differs from primary succession in that it occurs where there is already soil present as opposed to bare rock, like what is left behind after a glacial recession or a volcanic eruption. It is most obvious in a forest biome because forests show the most dramatic contrast between the disturbance area and the climax community succession is working toward. Depending on the community and location, it takes a varying amount of time to reach the climax community. Typically, the amount of time is shorter in the tropics and longer the closer you get to the poles. The climax community will remain in place until another disturbance occurs and restarts the whole process again. Natural disturbances are one way an ecosystem can become unbalanced. As the name implies, natural disturbances have natural causes, such as weather, geological forces, or biological changes. Fires and floods are examples of natural disturbances that force change upon an ecosystem. Natural disturbances are also caused by disease, severe storms, insects, volcanic activity, earthquakes, droughts, and long-term freezing. We are from Washington State, and this image has been on the cover page of Washington Life since May 18, 1980, when Mount St. Helens blew its top. This form of destruction, called actual destruction, destroys the habitat and some species instantly. The damage is immediate and extremely hard for the species to recover from. But recovery happened, and it happened faster than many realized. Discover those early adopters, who they were, and how they interacted with others across this ecosystem. These interactions are breathtaking and amazing. Severe volcanic eruptions blew Mount St. Helens top for a magnitude 5.1 earthquake triggering an enormous landslide. The entire north side of the mountain collapsed, releasing a furious sideways explosion that swept away forests in a devastating arc for miles to the north. Within minutes, a column of volcanic ash reached 15 miles above the earth. The volcano pumped out ash for more than nine hours, darkening the skies for more than a hundred miles. The world was changed. Fifty-seven people died in the eruption. Devastation stretched for 230 miles. Mud flows disgorged by the volcano swept down rivers, wrecking 27 bridges and 200 homes. Sediment filled shipping channels in the Columbia River, cutting off ports for days as dredgers worked to clear the rivers. Ash pumped into the upper atmosphere, circling the earth for 15 days. It lowered global temperatures. Seems this event classifies as a restart to succession right? Well, think about what survived, how it survived, and where succession restarted here at Mount St. Helens. We were all looking upwards 15 miles to watch the ash clouds. Who looked underground where hidden forces lurked? Well, it does not matter where we looked. 
It matters where succession restarts and how it spreads. This is where you will look right now. A landscape scale outbreak, infestation bark beetles, has ravaged pine. The devastation is widespread and rapid. Within two years, the host trees were killed, opening the landscape for new recruits, stored in the forest duff. Successful recruits will be shade tolerant and competing to occupy the upper levels of filtered sunlight. Over time, a lot of the natural habitats have experienced massive amounts of damage. Habitat destruction is defined as changing the area in which a plant, animal, or other organism lives to the point where the species can no longer survive. The second type of destruction, known as fragmentation, occurs when the land gets split into pieces. When a road is cut and paved through an area, the habitat is broken apart. This causes the animals to have to either cross the road and risk getting hit, or to stay in a smaller area with fewer resources. Plant species suffer as well. Their water resources may be altered, and there may be more animals eating the plants in the smaller area. This is a challenge of distribution and balance. The third type of destruction is degradation, happening when something is introduced to the ecosystem or habitat that causes harm. There are many things that can cause this kind of harm, such as a pollen and invasive species. If the forbs and grasses are ate by livestock, they cannot be eaten by ungulates. If the livestock are taken away by the rancher, they will not be left to feed the carnivores in the winter. It is all about trade-offs, and in the balance, there will be a new equilibrium. Secondary succession occurs when there is a disturbance that destroys the life balance in the ecosystem. But remnants, like soil, nutrients, and some seeds, remain. An example is a forest fire. Although the fire burns through the trees and disrupts the animal's habitat, the fundamental necessities for life remain. Since there is already nutrient-rich soil, the pioneer species do not need to prepare the area for other plants, and succession can occur quickly. Other incidents that may result in secondary succession include high winds from a hurricane or tornadoes or excessive flooding. When either type of succession has reached an equilibrium, the ecosystem is said to be in a climax stage. The living things in the ecosystem will remain at equilibrium without any drastic change in the makeup of the species until another disaster occurs again to induce succession. Consider the natural range of variability when observing stress events on the environmental balance. How have the species evolved through time as these natural wildfires burned? Successful species have adapted with restrictive environmental conditions, with strategies to thrive and survive. Education and good environmental decisions are our best defense at preserving these natural habitats. It is the forests responding to natural reoccurrence events, but this response includes sagebrush plant communities, grasslands, deserts, and aquatic ecosystems. Stress is a common aspect to all organisms. One of the characteristics we use more and more every year is the ability to understand vectors of risk. In this analysis, I used Geospatial Analytical Tools, GIS, to combine attributes such as slope, aspect, tree cover type, crown closure, position on the slope, and the history of past wildfire events to graphically display where wildfire risks are the greatest. Wildfire is a natural stress to forest land ecosystems in North America, but anthropogenic influences have intensified these factors, especially wildfire ignitions and their timing. Endemic species genomes have adapted to be responsive to wildfire risks, with species such as lodgepole pine developing what is called a serotonous cone. Serotonous cones are covered with a resin that must be milled for the cone to open and release seeds. When a fire moves through the forest, the cones open and the seeds are distributed by winds and gravity. This is how the tree species has adapted to the restrictive, frequent forest wildfire environment. In ecology, allergenic succession is succession driven by the abiotic components of the ecosystem. In contrast, autogenic succession is driven by the biotic components of the ecosystem. An allergenic succession can be brought about in a number of ways, which can include 
volcanic eruptions, meteor or comet strike, flooding, drought, and earthquakes. This wildfire raged in 2003 in Montana along the Clark Fork River as this regional wildfire event scoured millions of acres through Montana, Idaho, and Washington. This fire was started multiple times and in many places all by lightning. A landscape scale outbreak infestation of mountain pine beetle has nearly involved all pine trees, but because the mountain pine beetle is about to run out of food, non host trees become their new targets in the forest. The outbreak will collapse within two or three year period as food resources deplete. Primary succession occurs when a barren area of land is first colonized. An interesting example is the colonization of mining or rock quarries. Humans mine ores, minerals, and coal for industrial purposes, leaving barren land resources in the quarries. These areas have never been colonized by life previously. However, ecologists are now interested in both the spontaneous succession and the reclamation in these areas after humans introduce soil and species to them. These methods have been successful in primary succession of mosses, flowering plants, and insects like butterflies and bees. A natural example of secondary succession occurs in the grasslands of the Midwestern United States. Grasslands actually periodically burn to the ground to maintain their ecosystems. Some plants' seeds are only triggered to grow by the intense temperatures of a fire. The fires prevent larger shrubs and trees from growing over the grasses necessary for this ecosystem. After the fire burns, new grass seeds are triggered to grow. As the grass grows, larger plants, insects, and animals inhabit the area again until the next fire. Since there was an existing ecosystem before the fire, this is an example of secondary succession. Oftentimes, timberland disruption comes from the harvest of timber, followed by reforestation and stabilization efforts. In secondary succession of this type, an ecosystem previously existed and re-established. However, the semi-equilibrium status can be disrupted again from bark beetle infestations, windstorms, floods, or any other disruption event. Again I say, <laughs> imbalance is one of the constants of the natural environment. Autogenic change is caused by endogenous factors, by the plants themselves. Where changes are caused by exogenous factors, they are termed allogenic. Primary succession is the classic case of autogenic change in that the vegetation is part of the reason that the soils develop. Just as we looked at the fire-prone landscapes several minutes ago, we now look at a similar analysis to consider landslide-prone landscapes. Geospatial analysis combines several biotic and abiotic factors to discover landscapes prone to this ecosystem disruption episode. These factors are naturally occurring events, but again, they are influenced by anthropogenic factors such as a road placement, home construction, and vegetation management practices. Although these disruption events are considered extreme, especially when human life and structures are lost, as forest succession events are considered, landslides are not necessarily extreme. The plant materials remain, soil characteristics are left intact, and new life begins to spread quickly. Understanding risks and event severity can lead to implementation of astute land management practices. We come back again to primary succession, the colonization of new sites by communities of organisms. It often occurs after a devastating event has wiped out the organisms that lived in the area, or with the creation of new habitat. We can conceptually segregate these stages of succession into these four stages, culminating with a climax plant community, that is, if disruptions do not insert a cycle restart. Plant communities seek natural climax plant community equilibrium. But when this is disrupted, the new search for balance will define new pathways. The disruption may have returned the community to early seral stages like from a major wildfire. It might restart from an intermediate stage, such as after a flood or a windstorm. Each reset will define which plant and animal species remain in the disrupted ecosystem, and this sustains the options available. 
It is based on what genomes are suited to the niches they fill. This entire pathway of secondary succession is not obvious because the level of disruption dictates which survivors remain. We see here numbered events from the previous two screens to give meaning to each potential step forward. Plant communities will naturally seek that climax plant stage. Keep in mind, while it seeks that perpetual balance, disruptions will be a component of a changing balance. The K-selected species are perfectly evolved to outcompete and survive by forcing out smaller, less competitive members of the ecosystem. There was a time when those western larch, Douglas fir, and western white pine trees were small, struggling to grow above the mallow nine bark and ocean spray plants. However, once those trees surpassed them, the R-selected failed plants had to find greener pastures. While the K-selected trees have persisted year after year, forming a mature coniferous forest. Have you ever taken a walk through a recently burned forest? Maybe a few years after the blaze retired, you probably noticed the many fireweed plants, maybe some morel mushrooms. There are a lot of early invaders filling the space. You might have seen a few ferns, tree saplings, and other plants adapted to this environment. You could leave this forest today, return in 10 years, and notice that everything looks nearly identical, except those trees will be overtopping the shrubs and grasses thriving below. Come back in 10 more years to see the trees intermixed with competition in the crowns, struggling to be the tallest participants in the sunlight capturing battle. After another few decades, the young forests begin to witness shade tolerant trees in the understory. These cadets will ultimately be successors in this race. Self-replicating community means the overstory is comprised by the same species in the overstory as you observe sprouting in the understory. Western larch might be the tallest and most robust in the forest after 150 years, but ultimately, those trees will disappear from the climax forest plant community because they cannot sprout in the understory shade of their parents. Western red cedar and western hemlock will take those honors. K selection and R selection are the two broadest categories of life history strategies. The life history strategy of a species incorporates aspects of how the organism reproduces, its strategies for survival, and how the organism interacts with its habitat, and how it's able to compete with other organisms within the habitat. The K and R come from the mathematical equations used to predict and model population growth. We don't need to know the exact equations for this lesson, but knowing the parameters these letters represent can be helpful. K represents the carrying capacity, which is simply the number of individuals of a species that the resources in the habitat can support. R represents the population growth rate, which measures how fast a given population grows in relation to the initial population over a set period of time. The term selected refers to traits employed by the organism to optimize either the carrying capacity or population growth rate. And to clarify, traits that ensure the population doesn't exceed the carrying capacity would be K-selected traits. Traits that maximize the growth rate would be the R-selected traits. Of course, the process of evolution selects these traits. The organisms themselves don't choose which life history strategy they want to follow. For this reason, let's focus on case selection and some examples of case selected species. Life history strategy of a species incorporates aspects of how the organism can reproduce, its strategies for survival, how the organism interacts with its habitat, and how it's able to compete with other organisms within the habitat. An ecological niche is the role and position a species has in its environment, how it meets its needs for food and shelter, how it survives, how it reproduces. A species niche includes all of its interactions with the biotic and abiotic factors of its environment. It is advantageous for a species to occupy a unique niche in an ecosystem because it reduces the amount of competition for resources that species will encounter. 
Adaptation refers to traits employed by the organism to optimize either the carrying capacity or population growth rate. Key selected traits are associated with carrying capacity, and R selected traits are associated with the population growth rate. We see this brought to life when wolves were expatriated from the ecosystems of the United States early in the 20th century. This opened environments to other carnivores, such as coyote and cougar. Now the gray wolf has been reintroduced and intraspecific competition muscles wolf packs over the other carnivores. This is the return to the old normal. Most case-selected animal species develop slowly, care only for a few young over multiple births, and are strong competitors. Wolves and cougars are case-selected species, living for a long time and giving birth multiple times over long periods. Many provide intensive parental care, extending this through many year nurturing activities. While wolves raise their young pups in a community environment, cougars are loners. Cougar dens are only used by a female when rearing young. They can be crevices in rocks, this one near Colville, Washington. They can be cavities under tree roots or hidden spot in dense vegetation. They are sometimes lined with moss or other vegetation and might be used for several years. Cougars in Washington are capable of breeding at any time of the year, although birth pulses have been observed in January and August. Because adult male cougars have large home ranges that may overlap with those of several females, an adult male may breed with several females in any given year. Breeding males and females spend only a short period of time together, after which they separate, with the male playing no role in rearing of young. Cougar kittens, also called cubs, weigh just about over a pound of birth. Until they are two weeks old, the kitten's eyes and ears are closed. Kittens have blackish-brown spotted coats, which serve as camouflage to help conceal them from other predators, including adult male cougars. These spots begin to fade at about 12 to 14 weeks and continue to fade as the kittens get older before disappearing completely in about 18 months. These kittens, with spots still covering, are estimated by Dr. Ben Maletsky, WSU grad and of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, to be between 6 and 7 weeks old. Quote, any older than that and they would never have been able to catch them by hand. End quote. When raising kittens, the mother cougar will leave them alone for brief periods of time as she hunts for food to sustain herself and kittens. In this event, the cougar biologist commented that the mother was never more than 50 yards away. She watched everything. In the beginning, she will hunt relatively close to the den, but the kittens grow older, she will venture out further across their home range. Kittens remain with their mother for about 13 to 24 months while they learn hunting skills necessary to survive. Eventually, the mother will drive off her offspring, and they will set out to establish their own home range. Juvenile male cougars often travel hundreds of miles before finding a suitable area that is unoccupied by another cougar. We now take a step into some of the terminology used when discussing these interacting events beginning with amenalism. This is when one participant is harmed or impeded, and the other is neutral or positively affected. Degradation occurs when something is introduced to the ecosystem or the habitat that causes harm. This is amenalism witnessed when an off-site noxious weed is introduced to a plant community. Ketchetin is a flavin 3 ol a type of natural phenol and antioxidant. It is a plant secondary metabolite. It belongs to the group of flavin 3 ols or simply called flavanols, which is part of the chemical family of flavonoids. Cachetins are released into the ground by some plants, such as spotted knapweed, which hinders the growth of their neighbors, the native vegetation. It is a form of allopathy. Spotted knapweed is oftentimes studied for this behavior, as it releases cachetin isomers into the ground through its roots, having effects of an antibiotic or a herbicide. Most plants in the European ecosystems have defenses against cachetin, but few plants are protected against it in North American ecosystems where the spotted knapweed is an invasive, uncontrolled weed. 
the foreign invader has no natural competitors in the North American ecosystems. This is interspecific allopathy, known as competitive exclusion. Considering the aforementioned traits, you should be able to predict which species are case selected. In our forest example, the large trees, Douglas fir, western larch, and ponderosa pine, are case selected. They live a long time, grow very slowly, and can get large enough to outcompete the smaller species. There are always exceptions, however. Mice and mammals that are better described as are selected because they are small, able to reproduce early, and have many offspring with a high mortality rate. It's also important to note that not all case selected species will have all the traits. Sea turtles, for example, have long lifespans and slow development, but produce and abandon many offspring, of which few survive. In general, if a species demonstrates most of the traits, it can be classified as case selected. One final important point about case selected species the same traits that ensure populations near the carrying capacity also put them at higher risk of extinction. Low reproductive rate and advanced age of sexual maturity make case selected species unable to quickly replenish numbers in the event of a large number of deaths, be they from disease, habitat destruction, or any other natural or unnatural cause. Metapopulations become a significant factor in these population sustainability considerations. Population growth rates measure how fast a given population grows in relation to the initial population over a set period of time. Consider the interspecific interactions of neighboring trees as they compete for water, nutrients, sunlight, and space each species fighting for its place to fill its niche. Succession walks them through time to discover their ability to become self-replicating communities existing in all forms of ecological stress they face. On the north aspect of Kamiak Butte, we can see how these species compete for the limited resources, but it is Douglas fir that will capture the self-replicating title. It can sustain some amount of shading while it's young, and its long life will sustain it for centuries. Look at this habitat, you will see many organisms living and working together, fulfilling their ecological niches. For example, imagine you're walking through the forest, where there are leaves and needles scattered on the ground, and an old rotting log sitting on the forest floor. If you look closely, you could probably find earthworms just under the soil feeding on the decaying organic matter. There could also be centipedes eating small beetles and other organisms, as well as a colony of ants that work and feed on the dead insects. You may even find a couple millipedes strolling around, feeding on the decaying leaves. In this small section of vast forest, all of these organisms are filling an individual ecological niche. To some degree, their niches may overlap, but if you look into all aspects of their lives, including where they live, how they survive, and how they reproduce, you will see that they are each truly individual niches. You could think of each ecological niche as a part of a puzzle that go together to make the environment successful. Carrying capacity is simply the number of individuals of a species that the resources in a habitat can support. Around the world, invasive species take on different shapes and sizes and invade all types of habitats. Every ecosystem imaginable has at least one example of an invasive species. Some of the most publicized invasions in the United States include the zebra mussel into the freshwater lakes, the sea lamprey into the Great Lakes, ironfish into the Atlantic Ocean and Gulf of Mexico, and the plant kudzu in the south. There are, unfortunately, hundreds of other invasive species examples in the United States and around the world. According to the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, there are over 50,000 species in the United States that are non-native, and over 4,300 of those are invasive. In fact, invasive species are considered such a problem that in 1999, the White House formed the National Invasive Species Council, NISC, whose primary purpose is the detection and eradication of invasive species. Although some non-native organisms mesh very well with their new environment, and do not do any harm, others can have serious effects on their new home. These organisms are known as invasive species due to their intrusive nature. Invasive species are found in every type of habitat on Earth, 
including human homes. The number of invasive species has increased in past decades due to the rapid growth of worldwide transportation. As new technologies made it easier for humans to travel around the world, they also made it easier for invasive species to move around the world. Some invasive species are transplanted to a new environment by accident, such as species that get into boats and travel across the ocean unnoticed. Other invasive species are transplanted on purpose by humans who travel and want to bring something from their travels back to home and plant flowers or bushes because they like the way they look. No matter how an invasive species gets into its new environment, it is likely a direct result of human action. The effects of invasive species can be divided into three different types, harm to the physical environment, harm to other species, and harm to human health. In terms of harming the physical environment, many invasive species change their new environment and make it less habitable for others. Other common effects of invasive species on the environment include altering nutrient availability, water quality, and the flow of water. Some invasive species also affect their new environment by increasing the risk of erosion because the invasive species do not hold the soil as well as native species. We have discussed and will continue to explore the topics of trophic cascades. It is the incidence when a keystone species is removed from a natural ecosystem and balance is sought. We have seen examples of this involving sea otters and kelp and urchins. We see it when wolves changed rivers. It is still unfolding on Kamiak Butte as wolves were removed from this larger ecosystem about a hundred years before now. On this ecosystem, ungulates like deer, elk, and moose fed on grasses and forbs on this south aspect site. But wolves kept them at bay from overfeeding on it. With the wolves removed, the forbs, grasses, and shrubs have been overbrowsed. This created an opening where North Africa grass has found a stronghold. It is populating these sites slowly but surely. It is overpopulating the native vegetation. This is succession taken to the edge of community modifications. Invasive species can cause harm to other species that inhabit the environments they invade. Recall that ecosystems are delicately balanced. One small change has drastic effects on the ecosystem as a whole. The normal balance of an ecosystem can be altered when an invasive species is introduced because they can directly or indirectly affect native species, thereby changing the flow of energy in the system. Invasive species can directly kill native species by feeding on them and immediately reducing the population. Invasive species indirectly affect native species because they are new to the environment they invade and not preyed upon. Therefore, their population numbers quickly rise, and they can push out species that are native to the area by outcompeting them for food and space. Some invasive species harm native species because they bring with them toxins or parasites that the native species are not adapted to deal with. This is a reset to the anticipated trek into the Climax Plant Community Nexus. Climax Plant Community status may be achieved, but it will be different from the native community anticipated. Besides harming the environment and other animal and plant species, some invasive species are also known to cause harm to human health. Invasive plants can increase the severity of respiratory allergies due to the exposure to new pollen types. Some invasive plants also have saps and resins that can cause skin irritations. Invasive animals can be harmful to humans' health because some possess toxins and venoms that could cause serious health problems if passed to humans. A major concern about invasive species such as rodents, mosquitoes, and ticks is that they can transmit deadly pathogens to humans in their new environment. Normally, the diseases transmitted by invasive species are not common to the new environment, and this can cause delayed or incorrect diagnoses and possibly increase the likelihood of mortality. An example of an invasive species that has caused harm to humans in the current time is the coronavirus. The virus began its spread in Asia in late 2019. There were no known cures for it, no vaccines, and no natural resistance. It infects humans and is passed between individuals through touch and fluid transmission. 
Since its appearance, the virus has spread throughout the world and is our pandemic reality. Clear minds, acute thinking, and targeted responses will see us overcome this new challenge. There is some amount of natural resistance to the virus, but isolating the viral resistance takes time and energy. Although socially separated, we stand together. <laughs>